few days after the formal reestablishment of the Catholic worship, I saw a general officer arrive at the Tuileries who would perhaps have preferred the establishment of the religion of Mahomet and the change of Notre Dame into a mosque. This was the last general-in-chief of the army of Egypt, who people said had become a Muslim at Cairo, the ci-devant Baron de Menau. In spite of the latest check he had been subjected to by the English in Egypt, General Abdallah Menou was well received by the first consul, who soon after appointed him governor general of Piedmont. General Menou's bravery was equal to every test, and he had displayed the greatest courage everywhere. Then, on the field of battle and amidst the most difficult circumstances, after the day of August 10th, although he belonged to the Republican Party, he had been seen to follow Louis the Sixteenth to the assembly and had been denounced as a royalist by the Jacobins. In 1795, the Faubourg Saint Antoine, having risen en masse and advanced towards the convention, General Menou had surrounded and disarmed the seditious, but he had resisted the atrocious orders of the commissioners of the convention, who wanted to have the entire quarter burned in order to punish the inhabitants for their continual insurrection, sometimes after. Having again failed to comply, comply with the order of the conventionists to riddle the sections of Paris with grape shot, he was arraigned before a commission, which would have caused him to lose his head if General Bonaparte, who had replaced him in command of the Army of the Interior, had not used all his influence to save his life. Such multiplied acts of courage and generosity would suffice, and more than suffice, to excuse in this brave officer the otherwise very legitimate pride with which he boasted of having armed the National Guards and substituted for the white flag the tricolor, which he called my standard. From the government of Piedmont, he passed to that of Venice and died of love in 1810 in spite of his 60 years for an actress whom he had followed from Venice to Reggio. The institution of the Order of the Legion of Honor preceded by a few days the proclamation of the Consulate for Life. This proclamation gave rise to a feast which was celebrated the 15th of August. This was the anniversary of the first consul's birth, and people profited by the occasion to celebrate this anniversary for the very first time. On that day, the first consul completed his 33rd year. In the following month of October, I attended the first consul in his journey to Normandy. We stopped at Avery, where the first consul visited the battlefield. He said on reaching it, Honor to the memory of the best Frenchman who ever sat on the throne of France. And he ordered the restoration of the column which had been erected in the memory of the victory gained by Henri IV. The reader will perhaps thank me for giving here the inscriptions cut on the four faces of the pyramid. First inscription, Napoleon Bonaparte, first consul to the memory of Henri IV, victorious over the enemies of the state on the field of Ivry, March 14th, 1590. Second inscription, great men love the glory of those who resemble them. Third inscription, in the year nine of the French Republic, the seventh Brumaire, Napoleon Bonaparte for his consul, after having passed over this plain, ordered the reconstruction of the monument destined to consecrate the memory of Henri IV and that of the victory of Ivry. Fourth inscription, the misfortunes experienced by France at the epoch of the Battle of Ivry were the result of the appeal made by the different French parties to the Spanish and English nations. Every family, every party which calls foreign powers to its assistance has merited and will merit to the latest posterity the maledictions of the French people. All of these inscriptions have been effaced and replaced by the following. This is the place of the pillar where Henri IV stood on the day of Ivry, March 14th, 1590. Monsieur Lettier, mayor of Ivry, accompanied the first consul on this excursion. The first consul talked with him a long time and seemed well satisfied. The mayor of Ivry did not give him an equally good idea of his talents, hence he rudely interrupted him in the middle of a sort of compliment. This worthy magistrate was trying to pay him, but inquiring whether he knew of his confrere, the mayor of Ivry. No, General, replied the mayor. Well, so much the worse for you. I advise you to make his acquaintance. It was at Ivre also that an administrator of high rank had the opportunity of amusing Madame Bonaparte and her suite by a piece of naivete. 
which diverted everybody but the first consul because he did not like such silly things when they proceeded from a man of position. Monsieur de Ch did the honors of the county town to the wife of the first consul, and in spite of his great age, showed much alacrity and promptness in so doing. Among other questions dictated by her usual benevolence and grace, Madame Bonaparte asked him if he was married and if he had a family. Oh, Madame, I should think so, replied Monsieur de Ch with a smile and a bow. I have cinq de cinq enfants. I have, thank, I have five of them. Ah, mon Dieu! <laughs> cried Madame Bonaparte. What a regiment! It is extraordinary. How, Monsieur? Sixteen children? Says enfant. Yes, Madame. Says enfant. Says enfant. Repeated the administrator, not seeing anything very marvelous in that, and being astonished merely by the astonishment manifested by Madame Bonaparte. In the end, someone explained to the latter the error she had been led into by the dangerous liaison of Monsieur de Ch, adding as seriously as he could, "Did Madame to excuse Monsieur de Ch?" The revolution interrupted the course of his studies. He was more than sixty years old. From Ivry, we started for Rouen where we arrived at about three in the afternoon. Monsieur Chaptal, Minister of the Interior, Monsieur Mignot, Prefect of the Department, and Monsieur Commissaris, Archbishop of Rouen, came to meet the First Consul at a certain distance from the city. The mayor, Monsieur Fontenay, awaited him at the gates of which he presented him the keys. The First Consul held them for some time in his hands and then returned them to the mayor, saying in a tone loud enough to be heard by the crowd surrounding his carriage, Citizens, I I could not better confide the keys than to the change of the worthy magistrate who enjoys my confidence and yours by so many titles. He caused Monsieur Fontenay to get into his carriage, saying that he wished to honor Rouen in the person of its mayor. Madame Bonaparte was in her husband's carriage. General Monsi rode at the right-hand side of it. In the second carriage were General Soule and two aides de camp. In a third, General Bessiers and Monsieur de Lusay. In a fourth, General Lauriston. Then came the servants' carriages. Ambar, Bear, and I were the first one. I should try in vain to give an idea of the enthusiasm of the people of Rouen. On the arrival of the first consul, the market porters and boatmen in the grand costume were awaiting us on the outside of the city, and when the carriage containing the two august personages was within their reach, these excellent fellows ranged themselves in double file and preceded the carriage in this way as far as the hotel of the prefecture where the first consul alighted. The prefect and the mayor of Rouen, the archbishop and the general commanding the division dined with the first consul who displayed the most amiable gaiety during the repast and was most careful to inform himself concerning the condition of manufacturers, new discoveries, and the art of making fabrics, and in short, all they could relate to the prosperity of this essentially industrial city. In the evening and nearly all night, an immense crowd surrounded the hotel and filled the gardens of the prefecture, which were illuminated and adorned with allegorical transparencies in praise of the first consul. Each time that he showed himself on the terrace of the garden, the air resounded with applause and acclamations, which seemed to flatter him extremely. The next morning, after having made the round to the city on horseback and visiting the magnificent places by which it is surrounded, the first consul heard mass, which was celebrated at 11 o'clock by the archbishop in the chapel of the prefecture. An hour later, he had to receive the general council of the department, the municipal council, the clergy of Rouen, and the tribunals. He had to listen to a half dozen discourses, all conceived in nearly the same terms, and to which he replied in a manner calculated to give the orators the highest opinion of their own merits. All these bodies on quitting the first consul were presented to Madame Bonaparte, who received them with her usual grace. In the evening, Madame Bonaparte gave a reception for the wives of the functionaries. The first consul was present at this reception, a fact availed of in order to present to him several newly amnestied persons whom he received with benevolence. For the rest, there were the same illuminations, the same acclamations as on the evening before. All countenances wore a festive look which delighted me and, in my opinion, contrasted singularly with the horrible wooden houses, the dirty and narrow streets, and the gothic constructions which then characterized the city of Rouen. 
On Monday, November 1st, at 7 o'clock in the morning, the First Consul mounted a horse, escorted by a detachment of the young men of the city, forming a voluntary guard. He crossed the bridge of boats and went through the Faubourg saint Severin. On returning from this promenade, we found the people awaiting him at the head of the bridge who conducted him back to the hotel of the prefecture, making the air ring with shouts of joy. After breakfast, high mass was sung by Monsignor, the Archbishop, it being the Feast of All Saints. Then came the learned societies, the heads of the administration and the judges of the peace with their discourses. That of the latter contained a remarkable phrase. These good magistrates, in their enthusiasm, asked the First Consul's permission to surname him the Grand Judge of the Peace of Europe. As as they were leaving the apartment of the first consul, I noticed the man who had delivered the speech. There were tears in his eyes, and he was proudly repeating the response just made to him. I regret not having remembered his name. He was, I was told, one of the most respectable men in Rouen. His face inspired confidence and wore an expression of frankness that prepossessed one in his favor. In the evening, the First Consul went to the theater. The hall filled to the roof, presented a charming sight. The municipal authorities had caused a superb entertainment to be prepared, which the First Consul found greatly to his taste. He complimented the Prefect and the Mayor on it several times. After having seen the opening of the ball and made two or three turns around in the hall, he withdrew surrounded by the staff of the National Guard. A great part of Tuesday was employed by the First Consul in visiting the workshops of the numerous manufactories of the city. The Minister of the Interior, the Prefect, the Mayor, the General commanding the Division, the Inspector General of the County Police, and the Staff of Consular Guard accompanied him. In one manufactory of the Faubourg saint Sever, the Minister of the Interior presented to him the senior workman known for having woven the first piece of velvet in France. After complimenting this honorable old man, the First Consul also granted him a pension. Other rewards or encouragements were likewise distributed to several persons whose useful inventions recommended them to the public gratitude. On Monday morning early, we started for El Boeuf, where we arrived at 10 o'clock, preceded by some 60 young men of the most distinguished families in the city who, after the example of those of Rouen, aspired to the honor of forming the guard of the First Consul. The country all around was covered by and a numerous multitude coming from the surrounding communes, the first consul alighted at the house of the mayor of El Bouf, where he breakfasted. Afterwards, he visited the city in detail, seeking information everywhere, and learning that one of the principal needs of the citizens was the construction of a road from El Bouf to a little neighboring town called Rami. He gave orders to the minister of the interior to have the work begun at once. At El Bouf, as at Rouen, the first consul was loaded with homage and benedictions. We returned to the latter city at four in the afternoon. The merchants of Rouen had prepared a fete in the stock exchange. The first consul and his wife went there after dinner. He remained a long while on the ground floor of this great building where magnificent samples of the industries of the department were displayed. He examined all and had them examined by Madame Bonaparte, who wished to buy several pieces of stuff. Then the first consul went up into the first story. There, in a beautiful salon, were assembled a hundred ladies and misses, nearly all pretty, the wives or daughters of the principal merchants of Rouen, who were waiting to pay him their compliments. He sat down in this charming circle and remained there about a quarter of an hour, going afterwards into another hall, where he listened to the representation of a little proverb mingled with couplets expressive as one may guess of the attachment and the gratitude of the people of Rouen. This proverb was followed by a ball. On Thursday evening, the first consul announced that he would leave for Avra. The next morning at daybreak, I was in fact awakened by a bear at five in the morning who told me we would start at six o'clock. I had a bad awakening, which made me sick all day. I would have given a good deal to sleep some hours longer. Finally, we had to set off. Before getting into the carriage, the first consul made a present to Monsignor, the Archbishop of a snuff box with his portrait. He also gave one to the mayor bearing the inscription, the French people. We stopped at Côte for breakfast. The mayor of this town presented to the first consul a corporal who had made the Italian campaign. His name, I think, was Roussel and who had received a saber of honor as a reward of his fine conduct at Marengo. He was at Côte 
on a six months furlough and he asked the first consul's permission to stand sentry at the door of the apartment occupied by the August travelers. This was granted and when the first consul and Madame Bonaparte sat down at table, Roussel was called and invited to breakfast with his former general at Avra and at Dieppe. The first consul thus invited to his table all those, whether soldiers or sailors, who had obtained gun savers or boarding axes of honor. The first consul stopped for half an hour at Bullbeck, displaying much attention and interest in examining the industrial products of this arrondissement, complimenting the guard of honor who came to meet him on their fine appearance, thanking the priest for the prayers he addressed to heaven for him, and thanking and leaving in his hands and those of the mayor tokens for the poor of his passage. On the arrival of the first consul at Avra, the city was illuminated. The first consul and his numerous cortege marched between two rows of illumination stands of fiery columns of every sort. The vessels that were in the harbor looked like a forest in flames. They were surcharged with colored lamps at the top of their masts. On the day of his arrival, the first consul received only a part of the authorities of the city. He went to bed shortly afterwards, saying that he was sleepy. But by six o'clock next morning, he was on horseback, and for more than two hours, he was ranging the beach, the hillsides of Ingleville, for more than a league, the banks of the Seine, as far as the activity of Hawk, and he made the exterior round of the citadel. About three o'clock, the first consul began to receive the authority authorities. He conversed with them in the greatest detail about the works which must be accomplished in order that their port, which he always called the port of Paris, should attain the highest degree of prosperity. He did the subprefect, the mayor, the two residents of the tribunals, the commandant of the place, and the chief of the 10th half brigade of the light infantry, the honor of inviting them to his table. In the evening, the first consul went to the theater where they played a little piece written for the occasion about as good as such things ever are, but for which the first consul and especially Madame Bonaparte were well pleased with the authors. The illuminations were still more brilliant than on the previous evening. I especially remember that the majority of transparencies were inscribed with these words, 18 Brumaire, year 8. At seven o'clock on Sunday morning, after having visited the marine arsenal and all the basins, the first consul embarked on a little yawl. The weather being fine, and remained in the roadstead during several hours. His cortege was composed of a great number of boats filled with fashionable men and women and with musicians who played the favorite airs of the first consul. Several more hours were spent in receiving merchants to whom the first consul said openly that he had the greatest pleasure in conferring on the commerce of Avra with the colonies. That evening, there was a fete arranged by the mercantile community at which the first consul was present for half an hour. On Monday at five o'clock in the morning, he embarked on a luger and went to Onfleur. The weather was somewhat threatening at the time of departure, and several persons had tried to persuade the first consul to not go on board. Madame Bonaparte, to whose ears this rumor came, ran to her husband and begged him not to start, but he embraced her, laughing and calling her a trembler, and went aboard the boat that was awaiting him. He had scarcely done so, the wind suddenly became more calm. And the weather was magnificent. On his return to Avra, the first consul held a review on the Place de la Citadelle and visited the artillery establishments. He again received until evening a great number of public functionaries and merchants. And the next day at six o'clock in the morning, we started for Dieppe. At the moment when we arrived at Ficomp, the town presented an extremely curious spectacle. All the inhabitants of the neighboring towns and villages accompanied the clergy in chanting a Te Deum for the anniversary of the 18th Brumaire. These innumerable voices rising to heaven in prayer for him moved the first consul deeply. He repeated several times during breakfast that he had experienced more emotion from these chants under the vaulted sky than he had ever done from 
more brilliant music. We reached Dieppe at 6 in the evening. The first consul did not go to bed until after having received all the felicitations, which were certainly very sincere there, as they were at that time throughout France. At 8 o'clock next day, he went down to the wharf, where he stayed a long time watching the fishing boats come in, and then visited the Faubourg du Poyer and the works they were commencing in the basins. He admitted to his table the sub-prefect, the mayor, and three sailors of Dieppe who had obtained boarding axes of honor for distinguishing themselves at the combat of Boulogne. The first consul ordered the construction of a sluice in the last wharf and the continuation of a canal which was to extend to Paris but of which only a few feet had yet been built from Dieppe, we went to Gizor and to Beauvais. And finally, the first consul and his wife returned to St. Cloud after an absence of 15 days, during which time active restorations had been in progress in this ancient royal palace, which the first consul had decided to accept, as I shall presently explain, chapter 10. The journey of the first consul in the richest and most enlightened departments of France must have banished from his mind many of the difficulties he might at first have dreaded to encounter in the execution of his schemes. Everywhere he had been received like a monarch, and not he alone, but Madame Bonaparte had been welcomed with all the honors usually reserved for crowned heads. There was not the slightest difference between the homage paid from them and which with which they were afterwards surrounded, even under the empire, when their majesties made journeys through their dominions at different epochs. This is why I have entered into some details concerning this one. If they appear too long or too devoid of novelty to some readers, I beg them to remember that I am not writing merely for those who have seen the empire, the generation which was a witness of so many great things and which was able to see close at hand and from his beginnings. The greatest man of the century is already giving place to other generations which cannot and could not judge except on the testimony of that which preceded them. What is familiar to this person who has examined it with his own eyes is not so for others who need to have somebody relate to them what they could could not have seen. Moreover, details neglected as futile and common by history, which makes a profession of gravity, are perfectly suitable to simple souvenirs and sometimes enable one to understand and judge an epic well. It seems to me, for example, that the cordiality of the whole population and of the authorities towards the First Consul and Madame Bonaparte during their journey, journey in Normandy sufficiently shows that the chief of the state would not have to fear a very great opposition, at least on the part of the nation, when it should please him to change his title and proclaim himself emperor. Now, long after our return, a decision of the consuls accorded to Madame Bonaparte for ladies to assist her in doing honors of the palace. They were Madame de Remusant de Talouet, de Lucet, and de Loriston. Under the empire, they became ladies of the palace. Madame de Lucet often occasioned a laugh among the servants by little traits of parsimony. But she was good and obliging. Madame de Remusant was a woman of the greatest merit and very sensible. She seemed a trifle haughty, and that was the more noticed because Monsieur de Remusant was full of good nature. In the sequel, there was a lady of honor, Madame de la Rouchefoucauld, of whom I shall have occasion to speak later. A lady of the bedchamber, Madame de Lucet, who was replaced by Madame de la Viette, so gloriously known afterwards by her devotion to her husband. Twenty-four ladies of the palace, French women, among them, Madame de Remusant de Talouet, de Loristontenay, Derberg, Louise Derberg, afterwards the Countess de Lotbau, de Walsh Serrant, de Colbert, Land, Savary, de Turenne, Octave de Segur, de Montalivet, de Mariscot, de Bouillet, Solar, Lascarie, de Brignolet, de Canessy, de Chevreuse, Victor, de Montemar, de Montmorency, Matignon, and Marais. Twelve ladies of the palace, Italians. These ladies were on duty every month so that one Italian and two French women were always together. The emperor would not at first have misses among the ladies of the palace, but he relaxed his regulation for Mademoiselle Louise d'Arberg. Since Madame the Countess de Lobau and Mademoiselle de Lucet, who married Count Philippe de Sigur, 
author of the fine history of the Russian campaign, these two young ladies proved by their prudent and reserved conduct that it is possible to be discreet even at court. Four ladies d'annonce, Madame Soustras, Ducrest, Villeneuve, Felicité, Logroy, and Aigle Marcherie. Two chief ladies' maids, Madame Roy and Marco de Saint Hilaire, who had under their charge the grand wardrobe and the jewel cases. Four ordinary ladies' maids. A reader in men, the personnel of the household of Her Majesty the Empress, was composed in the sequel of a first equerry, Senator Harvilla, fulfilling the functions of Chevalier of Honor, a first chamberlain, general of division, Nan Suti. A second chamberlain, introducer of ambassadors, Monsieur de Beaumont, four ordinary chamberlains, Monsieur de Courtome, de Grave, Gallard de Bern, Hector d'Aubusson, de La Foyada. Four chief equerries, Messieurs Corbineau, Birkheim, Daudnard, and Foulet. A major dormo general of Her Majesty's household, Monsieur Anger Lowe, a private secretary, Monsieur de Champ. Two chief valets de chambre, Messieurs Frere and Duville. Four ordinary valets de chambre. Four ushers of the chamber. Two chief footmen, Messieurs L'Esperance and Darjean. Six ordinary footmen. The kitchen and sanitary officers were those of the emperor's household. In addition, six of the emperor's pages were always on duty near the empress. The first chaplain was Monsieur Ferdinand de Rouen, former archbishop of Cambrai. Another decision of the same epic settled the functions of the prefects of the palace. The four first prefects of the consular palace were Messieurs de Remusin, de Cramayel, appointed later as introducer of ambassadors and master of ceremonies de Luce, and Didolo, since prefect of Cher. Malmaison no longer sufficed for the first consul, whose household, like that of Madame Bonaparte, daily became more numerous. A more extensive dwelling had become necessary, and the first consul decided on St. Cloud. The inhabitants of St. Cloud had addressed a petition to the legislative body asking the first consul to be so good as to make their chateau his summer residence. And the assembly had hastened to transmit it to the first consul, supporting it even by his own entreaties and by comparisons which it believed flattering. The general formerly refused, saying that when he should have acquitted himself of the functions with which the people had charged him, he would consider himself honored by a recompense awarded by the people. But so long as he should be chief of the government, he would never accept anything, in spite of the determined tone of this response. The inhabitants of St. Cloud, who had the greatest interest in having their request granted, renewed it when the first consul was appointed consul for life, and this time he consented to accept it. The expenses for repairing and furnishing it were immense, greatly surpassing the estimates, and yet he was dissatisfied with the furniture and adornments. He complained to Monsieur Charvet, concierge of Malmaison, whom he had appointed concierge of this new palace and whom he had directed to supervise the distribution of the rooms and to look after the furnishing, that the apartments prepared for him were like those of a kept woman, that there was nothing in them but bubbles and knickknacks and nothing of importance. On this occasion, he again gave a proof of his eagerness to do what was right without disturbing himself about prejudices which still had much weight, knowing that there were at St. Cloud a great number of the formal servitors of Queen Marie Antoinette. He told Mr. Charvet to offer them either their former places or pensions. The greater number resumed their places. In 1814, people were much less generous. All these employees were sent off, and even those who had served Marie Antoinette.